March 2022 edition of Cats Poppy Break, where we, where we will be celebrating Women's History Month. My name is Bobby Benzer, and I am joined by my wonderful colleague, Sarah Shepard, and we are representing the Children's and Teen Services Department at Baker and Taylor, fondly known as CATS. Um, we also have our buddies Baker and Taylor with us as well. As Sarah is new to our team, we're so happy to have her. Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself really quickly? Sure. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to have gotten the opportunity to join the CATS team. Um, my name is Sarah Shepard, like Bobby said. I am originally from Norman, Oklahoma, uh, but have lived in Texas pretty much my entire adult life. Uh, I became a librarian at the Houston Public Library. I was there for 14 years, and the last six, I was the Children's Services Coordinator. So it was a really fun job, but I was ready for something new. So here I am with the wonderful CATS. Um, and I know a lot about libraries since I worked at a library for a very long time in a lot of different roles. Um, so I hope that um, I hope to make a lot of new library friends across the country. Let's say that. Awesome. Well, you've already made friends with our team and we're so happy to have you here. Um, I'm totally digging your background today. I thought I was being really cool. Everyone, I had my cat pin, but Sarah has like <laughs> always on brand. <laughs> I'm so my cat pins here. So, um, but we are both armed with our caffeine. Um, Sarah has a cooler mug. I think you got that at the Metropolitan Library in Oklahoma. When yeah, you I visited the Metropolitan Library in Oklahoma City, which was really cool. Beautiful building. If you're ever in Oklahoma City, check out their downtown library. It's amazing. But they have these beautiful little mugs for winter reading that I admired, and they gave me one. So um, showing that off, shout out Metropolitan Library. Awesome. It looks like it could hold a lot of coffee too, which is always good. Yeah, it's, it's big and it's like ceramic too. It's a very nice mug. I'm like going to sell the nice. mug. It's ceramic so you can put it in the microwave, which is extra nice. I love awesome. it. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, um, uh, so today Sarah and I are going to be talking about um, some really awesome titles worthy of Women's History Month. And then later we're gonna welcome a star-studded panel of writing and editorial talent behind the chapter book series, She Persisted. Um, without further ado, we're gonna start with our book talk and Sarah's gonna get us going. Okay, so my first book that I wanna talk about, it's not historical, um, but it is girl power. And so I love that, especially for, you know, young children. So my first pick is The Princess and the Pony by Kate Beaton. Um, you may be familiar with her webcomic, Hark a Vagrant. Um, this book came out in, I think, 2016. So it's a backlist title. But I want to make sure that if you haven't seen it already, that you get your hands on it because it's amazing. So it has our protagonist, this Princess Pinecone. Um, she's a very cute little spunky girl, and she wants to show the world that she is a great warrior like she feels inside. Um, so for her birthday, she asks her parents for a you know, war stallion, and she ends up getting a pony that looks something like this. <laughs> Uh, so not exactly what she wanted, um, but it was a birthday present, so she was still nice about it and gracious. Um, so she tries to train the pony up uh, for their upcoming big battle, and um, they end up winning the battle in an unexpected way, let's say that. Um, it's a really fun book, you know, it's got lots of appeal. One thing I really loved about it um, when it came out is kind of in like early days of, of like really pushing diversity. Her parents are biracial, or I guess she's biracial. Her parent, her mom's African-American and her dad's like a Viking. Well, maybe she's not African-American. They're Vikings. <laughs> so her dad's white. Um, and so she's biracial. And I love that it's, it's not like uh, brought up in any kind of way. Like, oh, look at this. It's just, she is, you know, she's just her own person. And I love that about it as well. Um, so it's a really fun, cute book. Uh, Princess and the Pony, Kate Beaton. Check it out. Get your hands on it. You won't be disappointed. Women's History Month equals Women's Empowerment Month. So yeah, awesome. And then you had another another uh, title to you, Sarah. I got two. Oh, so I'm okay. gonna, actually, I have. I'm going to hold them up. Um, but we have Little Golden Books. Hey, Bobby, did you know that we currently have Little Golden Books in paw prints editions? Yes, our pre-binds editions. Our name is back too, guys. Paw Prince pre-binds are back. 
Um, we're very excited about that. But do continue, Sarah. So instead of um, having your little golden books on a shelf like this, where all you can see is the spine and you don't know what the title is, uh, you can get those paw prints. They have the titles on the spine. So I love that. But anyway, I'm going to talk about the, the contents of the books. We've got um, my little golden book about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, a wonderful historical at this point figure. Um, really important in women's rights and rights for everybody in general. Um, and then we have also my little golden book about Dolly Parton, the who's you know, a living legend. <laughs> um, everybody loves Dolly, right? Um, so you can teach your kids about Dolly. Um, one thing that like, I really, I'm not like the hugest Dolly Parton aficionado, but I do enjoy her. Um, you know, I enjoy her sassy attitude and how she came up from humble roots. Um, one thing I really love about this book is they have a page in there talking about the imagination library um, that she created. And that's, um, it's very cute. I have a three-year-old daughter. I registered her for the imagination library as soon as it was available in my zip code. And she uh, loves getting the books. And she, when she was even like younger, but she would be like, she would see the last picture and she'd go, Dolly Parton. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was so cute. She loved getting books from Dolly. And I know a lot of kids, you know, across the country get to take advantage of that opportunity. Maybe from your library. I don't know. Um, but I love reading about Dolly Parton and finding out about, you know, living your dreams, no matter if people think that you can do it or not. Living legend Dolly Parton. And then Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, you know, really pushing the limits, becoming the second uh, woman justice of the Supreme Court, um, you know, persevering. She went through law school while she had a baby, which I didn't know. And that's amazing. Like, what a strong woman. What a role model we want to have for all of our girls, right? And those are my two, two little golden book picks. Two fierce, beautiful women. I adore Dolly Parton. I really loved the compilation she did with Linda Ronsta and Emmylou Harris. Um, just throwing out there, if, if no one's ever listened to those compilations, they're wonderful. But of course, everything she's done for literacy and kids is just quite amazing. Um, thank you for bringing up the pre-bind, Sarah. It might be important. Uh, um, good to note that we have a, um, a sale going on on those right now. Uh, for yeah. Books, 25% off through May. So take advantage. Encanto. Is part of that. Yeah, in Canto. <laughs> so um, another kind it's of on there. Um, in Maribel. So uh, thanks for bringing bringing those up. Sure. What books do you have, Bobby? Oh, sorry. I thought you had one more, but the, okay. No, the, I, I did two in one. The Goldens. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm going to switch us over to nonfiction real quick. Um, so the first book I had is Girls Who Green, 34 Rebel Women Out to Save Our Planet. It's an inspired collection of profiles featuring environmental change makers, social entrepreneurs, and visionaries and activists um, by journalist Diane Cap. And it includes actionable sidebars with information on how to write a grant, which I thought was super cool, how to launch a GoFundMe campaign, and how to reach out to companies and encourage them to go green. So really actionable items to make change even in your in your community. Um, it's gotten some really nice reviews from leaders across the world, including, including former VP and environmental activist Al Gore and Mary Robinson, the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and the first female president of Ireland. Um, Kirk has called it, quote, a celebration of women who are devoted to reducing the impact of climate change in a variety of creative ways. Um, a truly comprehensible collection that's quite beautiful, actually. Um, here are a couple illustrations um, from the interior here. So I hope that you will include that one in your collection. And next, you may have heard me talk about this one before, um, starting a couple months ago, but I absolutely loved this YA novel, which pubs this week, actually. And um, I thought it fits in really nicely with our theme here, Great or Nothing. Um, it's a story, um, a reimagining of Little Women set in 1942 um, in war-torn, um, the war-torn world, right? Um, um, and the U.S. is suddenly embroiled in the Second World War. Um, it's told from each March's sister point of view, um, and it's written by um, a different writer. So there's four writers in this for this novel. Um, it's beautifully written, um, you know, themes of 
of grief, love, self-discovery, but also sisterhood and female empowerment um, for every literary lover out there, every historical fiction lover or budding feminist, right? So um, the collaborative is by Joy McCullough, Tess Sharp, Carolyn Tong Richmond, and Jessica Spotswood. Um, three of the point of views are in prose, one in poetry. Um, that's Beth's um, part from Beyond the Grave, actually. Um, oh. And um, there are a lot of Little Women retellings out there, but I thought the format and style of this was really interesting and uniquely done. And kudos to the storyline of Joe, um, who for the first time in the history of this fictional family is seen coming to terms with her queerness um, in this book. So that's a change that I think is really cool and will please a lot of a lot of readers out there. Booklist called this a must read for um, Louisa May Alcott fans um, and anyone who believes in the power of sisterhood. And Kirkus Reviews called this refreshingly acerbic, which I thought was like a really great <laughs> word to de describe it too. So, all right. And lastly, there is a new beginner chapter book series out there. Um, that honors one of my favorite female writers of all time, Dame Agatha Christie. I was such a nerd growing up for Agatha Christie. I read all her books when I was 13. Um, I had a little journal to keep track of all the books and who I thought the murderer was in each one. It was, it was quite fun. Um, <laughs> so like a little this, detective notebook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, you know, each page was for each story and we're supposed to keep track of the clues and who you thought the murderer was. It was <laughs> quite dorky, but um, I owe I, I owe my my interest in, in books um, with that point in my life. Um, so the series is called uh, Christy and Agatha's Detective Agency. Um, it's about two twin sisters who solve mysteries um, in the 1920s. Christy can usually be found up a tree or trying a spot of amateur engineering. Her shy twin, Agatha, buries her nose in books and dreams of being a writer. The pair couldn't be more different, um, but when a scientific discovery goes missing, they find that together they make a winning combination and Christy and Agatha's detective agency is born. Obviously, these are different elements of the true Agatha Christy, right? Um, the first title is called a Discovery Happens. It published in January. There are two more coming this year, and they're just so much fun, so cute. Um, they're, you know, they combine STEM and mystery and history. It's just so well done. Black and white illustrations throughout. Obviously, a really great segue into um, the real Agatha Christie books. So, um, those are currently only available in paperback, but we are, as of uh, today, actually um, putting them into our Paul Prince pre-bind edition. Yeah. So there will be editions that will stand up to um, uh, circulation at the libraries. Do those Real sound good? <laughs> That's amazing. I, I think there's always, uh, you know, kids want mysteries a lot and there aren't really a ton for kind of like the younger set. No. So I think that will be a popular book that people want to put on their shelves. Exactly. Awesome. And again, a great figure in history for um, writers and womankind. So that was our book talk set portion of today's segment. And we do have a selection list available of all the books we discussed today that are available on Title Source, so you can check that out. Um, next up, we're going to welcome our um, guest authors and editor. Thank you for having us. Um, this is so exciting for me because I get to work with these writers, but I rarely get to see their faces, and it's always so nice when I do. Um, I've got a question specifically for each of you. And then I think let's kind of um, chat a bit after that. So Kelly, I'm gonna start with you um, because Coretta Scott King came out uh, pretty recently and it's very exciting to have her book out in the world now. And I know you and I have chatted a lot about this, but in addition to being 
Dr. King's wife. Um, Coretta Scott King was also an extraordinarily talented musician who was able to contribute to change and making a difference in that way. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to hear kind of what her story meant to you, what telling her story meant to you, um, and, and whether there was anything you learned that was surprising in your research. Thank you so much. And thank you to Baker and Taylor for having us. It was such an honor to have the chance to write in this series and um, to focus on uh, Coretta Scott King. One of the things that um, you know, gave me such joy was that when we think about the civil rights movement, often it's centered on men. Um, and there were you know, wonderful men, you know, Dr. King and John Lewis and Ralph Abernathy and so many amazing people. But it's so important to remember that walking side by side were women. The civil rights movement would not have been possible without the vision and the hard work and the dedication and the creativity and the heart of women. And so um, getting the chance to tell Coretta Scott King's story, I feel moves that uh, focus and that lens on women like her who you know, made all of these um, you know, movements possible. Specifically in her case, she was someone who grew up in a really you know, strong, loving, faith-filled family. She grew up in Alabama, so was faced with, you know, really harsh, um, you know, racism and, um, you know, moments that were difficult to, you know, kind of understand as a kid, how people could be so cruel to one another. And all of that kind of fueled her purpose and using her life to give back and to create change and to be um, a steward of you know, her fellow man and to push for non-violence. Non you know, we have Dr. King Day, which is wonderful, it's a day of service, but it's important to also honor Mrs. Coretta Scott King on that day and all through the year. Um, in every instance, when we think about the different ways that Dr. King fought for justice and for equity, she was there, you know, she was there on the ground, marching with him. She was his intellectual and spiritual partner, um, you know, when they were home, talking through speeches, talking through moments, um, you know, in some ways she um, spoke out even be, before he did in certain areas, like speaking out against the Vietnam War. So um, I'm, I'm just so honored to have the chance. And one of the things that I learned about her that I didn't know was that she created this really revolutionary series of concerts that were um, you know, freedom concerts where she sang all over the country and raised money for the movement. And she raised more than $50,000. Um, and she did it in a really unique and special way where it blended um, storytelling, uh, moments from the movement, as well as her classical gifts for singing and really brought the movement to life for, for people who may not have really understood what it was like. She made them feel it in their spirit. And I think that, you know, the lesson for, for all of us and particularly to pass on to kids is that who you are is everything. You have everything you need inside of you to make a difference and to create change and to shine. And she's such a beautiful model of that. So that, that, that was what really, um, you know, kind of lifted me as I read her story. Mm -hmm. And I think can also help kids understand that who they are is not just enough, it's everything. I think that's such a wonderful message and it really comes through in the story you wrote about Coretta Scott King. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, it was just, just fascinating. And I learned, I learned from it too. I learned from all of your books, um, which is for me, one of the best parts about editing this series is that I learned something in every single one of these chapter books. Um, all right. So I'm going to continue in backwards publication order, which takes us to Renee. Um, so of the, all three people here, Oprah Winfrey is the only one who's still alive. Yes. So <laughs> I wanted to hear a little bit more about um, 
what it was like capturing such a strong magnetic woman who is still living. Um, did that did that make you feel any differently about writing it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I always wanted to write by the people I'm writing about and for, but there was a sense of um, making sure that I'm getting it right because in so many ways, also her story is not finished, right? So I, did, I didn't want um, to leave it off either, um, feeling like um, she's someone that we're talking about um, almost in this past tense about her legacy while I believe she's still building her legacy. But the, I think what's powerful about that is showing young people that you have living legends among you and that we don't only have to celebrate people who are no longer with us, but that the people right around us in our world right now are worth celebrating and honoring and thinking about what they have contributed, what they are contributing and what they're going to mm -hmm. continue to, to do in the world. So that was exciting to, to think about. Um, and I really wanted to, to make sure that her voice was present. So I use a lot of interviews and quotes from directly from her when I was thinking about the, the resources that I was gonna research to you know, come up with what am I going to write about? What am I going to say? I just went to her. And that, so that was beautiful. There's, she talks about her life so much that it was yes. um, easy for me to, to pick out things that she has already said about who she is and to break that down and share it to young people. So yes, it was intimidating, but also exciting to have that challenge of writing about someone who is still with us. So was there anything surprising you learned as you were going through all of the things that she's shared about so, herself? I have to say, you know, I grew up watching the Oprah Winfrey show. It's just so much a part of, of my life, my family. I've read a lot about her prior to, to writing this book. So I knew a lot about her. I did not know that she um, would talk to the animals on her farm and kind of, you know, preach to them, quote scriptures. Um, she was already at a very, very young age practicing, performing for the world, you know, and the world stage um, was something that I think all through her childhood she was being prepared for. And I love that she was going around to different churches, different organizations in her community performing and sharing scriptures from the Bible and entering these contests um, and sharing her voice, which is so much who she becomes, right? Like she's not only performing for performance sake, but she um, has a message and she's always had a message, even as a kid. And so I love this idea, kind of what, you know, what Kelly was saying is that sometimes we um, brush away talent. So like, oh, that's so cute. He likes to sing or, oh, that's so cute. She is always acting in her room with her dolls, but I think those natural talents that we're just born with, things that we just love to do, those interests can really be the reason why we were put on this earth. And if we nurture those things and help uh, grow those talents that they can not only make you know, a career for you and, and make you a financially stable person and all, the, right. all of that, but also give you fulfillment. Um, Absolutely. I think in her toughest times, she leans into words and she leans into mm -hmm. scriptures and quotes and poetry. And that's been a part of her life, even as a kid. So that was, um, I knew that intellectually and in my head, but reading it and hearing her talk about it so much and then thinking about, well, why is that relevant to a child? It was mm -hmm. really exciting to um, hopefully have a child read this and think, oh, I like to do this right now. I like to write or, you know, I like right. to make up raps. And maybe one day they'll do that. And, and I think that that's something powerful from her story. Yeah, I grew up watching Oprah too. And, and um, I didn't know that about her as a kid quoting scripture in different churches. And I thought that was so cool to find out and to just hear more about her as a child and what she was yeah. like, uh, which I is something else thinking... that I think is fun with these books. Sorry, I'm cutting you off. I, no, no. What I also didn't know is that she told her teacher um, that she was too smart to be in this class. She was like, I already know how to great. write. I am writing big words like hippopotamus. I know how to spell, um, you know, these long names that were in the Bible. Um, so she advocated for herself 
And this is a time when young Black girls weren't necessarily being told, you know, speak up, Black girl magic, be proud of where you come from. Like, you know, so at a time when we were, as a people, um, being segregated against and told to be silent and stay in your place, um, she, as not only a girl, but a Black girl, advocated for herself. And that was a beautiful moment to learn about, too. As soon as I read that, oh, that has to go in the book. That has to be a yes. scene where we see her kind of standing up for herself um, and advocating for the kind of education that she wants. I thought that was very powerful. And I feel like it was, you could see a straight line from her as a kid to her as an adult in moments like that. Um, All right, Christine. um, So at the heart of your book about Maria Tallchief, I think is the concept of identity and staying true to yourself, no matter where you are. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that um, and if Maria Tallchief's experience um, sort of resonated with you in any way um, in your life. For sure. Thank you so much, Jill. And before I answer that, I just have to say, uh, Renee and Kelly, you are both so radiant and eloquent and... um, what incredible people to be writing this series and to be sharing these amazing women's stories. Um, you're, you've both really done them justice and I, I've learned so much from you and uh, thank you for sharing your, your light and your brightness with us today. Um, anyway, so, <laughs> so on the topic of identity in Maria's story, um, she's similarly was born and raised through a really tumultuous time to be a young native girl. Um, She lived through some pretty serious assimilation policy eras and uh, sort of, we were talking a lot about these histories now about the impact of boarding schools and the residential school experience and all these things that uh, Native folks were really coerced into sending their children into these really westernized spaces to completely forget themselves and their cultures. And um, that is something that I think we are still sort of grappling with as a nation and at it, there's many more conversations to be had there. And even though that wasn't exactly her experience, I think that that era and that time of everything that was happening historically really impacted her self-esteem when she was a kid and her sort of everything that she experienced. So when she was, she was born in Oklahoma, her family relocated to Los Angeles to help support her dance education and to give her access to start better dance schools. And even though she always excelled in academic school as well as her dance education, uh, she was bullied a lot in school and she didn't really fit into sort of either one of those worlds. And um, later on, when she was a sort of young, budding professional dancer, she received professional advice from folks who told her that in order to really excel and stand out in the dance world, she should consider uh, changing her name to something that sounded more Russian, because most Russian uh, professional prima ballerinas came from Russia at the time. And so they asked her to become Tolchiva instead of tall chief. And um, I think that it's a real testament to her character and her integrity that despite um, these kids who asked her why she didn't wear feathers in her hair to these adults in her life who told her, your name should change if you really want to have this be your career and you should go by something else, that she really just said no. And she kind of stayed true to herself and she held tight to her Osage identity, which, you know, the the Osage nation has a really rich history and she loved growing up 
in Oklahoma and she loved her family and she knew that there was like really proud, deep histories behind the tall chief name that she did not want to give up. So for me, I just think that, you know, it really, it really is um, inspirational to learn these stories about these people and the sort of the time frames that they grew up in. And I really tried to add some of that context to Maria's story so that kids would understand that even though uh, her family happened to be wealthy and she lived through, like she was able to go relocate to Los Angeles and do all these things and that she grew up to become someone who would travel and perform on some of the oldest and grandest stages in the world. She was the first American to perform at the Paris Opera Ballet in France and at the Bolshoi Theater in Russia. She did these incredible things, but she still had her own uh, things that she battled personally. And that um, I think it's kind of easy to learn, to hear these, to hear about these legends and to just think, oh, they must have always been strong. They must have always, you know, just sort of been supported or found their way and felt confident in it every step of the way. And I really tried to, even though she ultimately was strong and confident in all those things, I really wanted to show that she, she was also a shy kind of vulnerable kid once and that she was someone who was new in the dance world once and that um, she persisted. Yeah. <laughs> Find it all. Um, that the story about her refusing to change her name is is one of my absolute favorites um, from that book about her because mm -hmm. you know I feel like there are so many people in that same situation who would have said do whatever I'll do whatever I need to succeed I want to be a ballerina sure I'll change my name like sure I'll cut my hair like whatever you know yeah. and the fact that she was like this is who I am and I will succeed or not as myself I think is just right. so powerful. I agree. I agree. And I think that that is something that she just, you know, it is really important to honor and respect the names that people want to be known as, right? And so um, that's not just another, another great lesson from her story and from her life that I think kids can really learn from and share. Yeah. And as I asked Kelly and Renee, was there anything um, that you found super surprising while you were researching Maria Talchi? Um, yes. So <laughs> there was actually, there was this one sort of moment from her, like her first performance, which I really honed in on. And I guess this is something that for me felt really important because again, this is a kid, this is a kid's book. And so I really wanted to place a bigger emphasis on her sort of early life and her uh, childhood and sort of teen years, because again, as I said, I just really wanted to show that she was just a kid with, uh, with this passion once, but that she also at her first performance, the very first time that she kind of had this leading role in at the Hollywood bowl in California, she went out on stage and immediately tripped. <laughs> and this is just like one of those things that, um, if I were, I don't know, a movie director, you know, creating like a drama of her life, or if I were someone who was sort of focused on like a different angle of presenting her story, I don't know if this is a moment I would have dedicated like a kind of almost a whole chapter to, but to me, it felt very important yeah. to show kids, look, the very first time she went on stage, she tripped and it shook her up and she... Uh, you know, in her autobiography, I mean, this is something she talks about in reference, and she really, you could kind of tell through the way that she wrote about it, the way she described it, that that was like one of those moments where she really was like, once again, oh my gosh, am I even cut out for this? Or, uh, you know, when you're 15 years old, and that happens on your first big performance, and you're in front of all these people on this big stage for really the first time of your life, she could have very easily just been like, you know, 
that was traumatizing. I'm just going to hang up my tight shoes and go find something else to do because I'm really good at school and I'm really good at all these other things. And she was also like a, a piano player. There were so many other directions her life could have gone. And yet she chose to get back up and she chose to keep dancing even after that. And I think that is really moving. So Amazing. that was one thing that stood out to me <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I feel like there are so many times in, uh, in what you were just saying where I just one right and she persisted she persisted yes. it's, it's, it's the message of her whole life like it is it with is. all of these women you know um really so I have a question for all of you which which relates to these stories but relates to other stories as well um you know there's been a lot of talk recently about banning books and particularly about banning books that contain actual history in them and all of your books, um, you know, because they're true, they're nonfiction, um, contains bits of history and not all of it is pretty. And I just wanted to hear, you know, a little bit about what kind of message you would share with librarians or teachers or children if, if that, you know, they were listening to this about um, what it means to share stories, what it means to share history, and what it means to share things that are not always comfortable or easy or, or pretty. Anyone can jump in. I think that um, sometimes adults feel that they're um, pro protecting kids, that at, at least that's the language that is used. But, you know, kids, are so just, you know, full of hope and love and curiosity and uh, re re resilience. And they really thrive when they are, you know, given the um, re respect that they deserve by showing history as it really happened. You know, it doesn't do anybody any favors to give them some you know, sanitized version of what has happened when we look at the actual, um, you know, moments that have shaped this, uh, you know, nation for better and for worse, kids are able to think about what has happened in the past and, you know, things that they can do to make sure they don't continue those errors, um, you know, as we move forward. I think when I think about Coretta Scott King's life and how, you know, when, when she was a teen, her um, family home was, was burned to the ground by racists. When, you know, she was uh, married to, you know, Dr. King and um, they had their house bombed. When Dr. King died, uh, just days later, she went with her children and continued his work and gave this inspiring message and I think in stories like that, there is teaching kids that no matter how difficult things are, no matter how bleak they may seem, that there's always hope. And there's that spirit of people who have um, this passion and this purpose to make a difference. And it takes one, one person being willing to st stand up to get it started, but there's so many others who will come together and unite. And that's how change happens. And that's how movements happen. And without a you know, real look at the past, without really you know, kind of reconciling all of those um, mistakes and bad uh, uh, ex ex uh, experiences and you know, things that were really terrible that were done. And you know, looking at that you know, square in the eye, you know, how, do, how, how are we able to help kids grow and develop into the, the leaders and the change makers that they're meant to be? So I think that, you know, these stories are ones that can empower kids, that can give them hope, that can build resilience and let them know that no matter what they face, they can get through it. And also that they have the power to tell their own stories, that their stories matter and that you know 
sometimes you can feel all you know by yourself when you're dealing with really tough things. And I think being able to read about other uh, you know people in the past who have come through you know so many horrors and so many you know difficult moments that builds that inner fortitude in yourself and makes you hold your head higher. So I would ask all the adults out there to please trust our kids and believe in them that um, not, not, not only you know, will they become informed by what they read, but they will also rise and, and soar through it. It's beautiful. I think too, um, thank you, Kelly. I everything, I amen to everything you just said. Um, I think also it, it validates what young people are experiencing and seeing in the world right now, but might not have the language for. So if I feel some, like if I think about Oprah's life, um, she had to deal with racism, body shaming um, because of her skin tone and size, um, sexual abuse, all these things happen to her. And if, if a child is experiencing those things too, and doesn't know that this is not just something that has happened to me. There's nothing wrong with me. I didn't bring this on myself, but these things happened in the world. And they happened to someone who is very successful and who has healed from those things and who has you know, been able to grow and, and still feel, be loved in the world. Um, I think that that's important for them to see that. So the telling the truth of the past validates the truth of the present. And it says to a young person, you have inherited this world and, and some of what you have inherited is not so great. And these people did something to start change and to use their voices, their art um, as a way to stand up and push back against oppression. Now, what are you going to do? How are you gonna add on to the legacy of all these women who've come before you? So I think it's, yes, it is hard and sad. And I think, you know, it is students should feel uncomfortable. I don't think you should feel comfortable learning about racism, right? That should make Absolutely. a child feel um, feel some kind of emotion. But then what do you do with that emotion? Anger and discomfort and frustration push us to move and to, to change things. If we're, if we're comfortable, we never change. We never mm -hmm. try to do anything. And so I, I think it's okay um, with love and gentleness um, to have conversations that might be difficult with young people because they are experiencing these things on the playground, in their homes. They know that something is going on. And if no one is talking about it, I think it makes you feel, well, what's wrong with me? Am I the only one that feels this way? And so when we, especially the adults in their lives can say, oh no, babe, you're not the only one. <laughs> and actually there's a name for what's happening and people have been fighting against what's happening for many, many decades. And yeah. I think that helps them feel less alone and less overwhelmed. Um, and I think that that's empowering. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um... You've both already said so much that I absolutely agree with. I'm just going to add on one quick uh, note from when I was first given this opportunity to write Maria's story. I took it upon myself to kind of go and explore some of the biographies and other ways that her story has already been told that exists in the world. And in one book, I came across um, early in Maria's life, she and her family would go to these sort of secret powwows in remote corners of their reservation in Oklahoma. And at the time, this was because um, Native American gatherings and religious and ceremonial practices were banned in the US. It was illegal for them to gather and to worship or to tell their tribe's histories and to tell their own stories and to have these communal experiences, which they had practiced for thousands of years, right? So um, I knew that historical context myself. I came across uh, another biographer who had covered Maria's story and the way that they talked about her going through these secret gatherings um, on the Osage reservation was so wrong to me because they talked about it in a very pseudo spiritual way as if they were like out there summoning the ghosts of their ancestors. Um, 
maybe this author knew about that history and was trying to write it in a way that didn't directly talk about the fact that these meetings were banned and that they could have gotten in serious trouble if they had been found out or that, you know, or about the um, American Indian Religious Freedom Act that wasn't passed until the 1980s, or maybe they, but they didn't talk about any of these specific things at all. And the way that they talked about these gatherings, and I don't know if this was them taking their own creative license or what exactly they were aiming to do. All I know is the fact that when I read that, I was like, this could, this kids could interpret this as like Native Americans being these magical beings with a special relationship with something spiritual that was not really what was going on. What was going on was they were risking their lives in order to keep their histories and their culture alive for the generations that would come after them. And so that they would have, you know, their language, pers their languages persevere when they were being, when their children were being sent to these boarding schools to speak only English. And when all these other things were going on when they were facing genocide. Um, so to me, when I read that account in another Maria Talchi biography, I was like, we're going to be very specific here in the She Persisted series, if I have anything to do with it. Because um, when kids are not given the full story, when they're not given the straight direct facts of what was going on at a particular moment in history, it is possible for them to fill in with their own imagination, right? Or for yeah. them to completely miss uh, the real historical significance of what was going on and what people were really facing. And as a byproduct of that, what they persisted through. And so to me, um, that sort of thing was very important. And um, yeah. Yeah. And it, I think that it can story. be difficult. It can't be, sorry. It can be difficult to talk about for sure. But I do think that as Kelly and Renee have already sort of said, we can trust our kids to handle difficult. And as the adults in their lives, I think we owe it to them. Sorry for jumping in too early, but I just wanted to say that I think that the way that you explained the history of the Osage Nation in the Maria Tall Chief, um, she persisted, is so phenomenal. And it, it gives kids facts on their level and yeah. is just really, really a wonderful example, I think, of, of how, um, how the Osage history can be explained simply and easily and clearly. Um, so yeah, I thought you did a really wonderful Thank you. Job. And thank you for guiding me through that too. You were a big help with editing the process. It was great. Well, I just wanted to just say to um, Christine who gave such kind praise to me and to Renee that, you know, you are so eloquent and, you know, listening to you and your passion for Maria Tal Talchi's story um, makes me want to Make sure every kid in the country has a copy. So, you know, thank you for, you know, putting your heart into the book. Um, thank you for caring about accuracy and, you know, making sure kids can see themselves and, and know how, how much it matters to see one another. So thank you for that, Christine. And, and Jill, thank you for guiding all of us. You know, you, it, it was wonderful to work with you and with Talia. And thank you to Chelsea Clinton for coming up with this you know, wonderful series. And I love that we're, we're you know, celebrating incredible women who have made a difference. So thank, um, thank you for including us. It's an absolute pleasure to work with every single one of you. And I, I've been saying since the series started that this is like the gift of my career to get to work on these books that I feel so passionately about, these women whose stories I'm so glad we're getting to share with, with kids. And this superstar team of writers that is just makes every moment of, of this, these books an absolute pleasure and joy. So it's, um, it's really, it's just, it's just been a gift to me. So, um, and I know that's not the point, but it has been. Um, so thank you, all of you. Thank you for all of your brilliant words about these women and, and all of the thought that you've put into these stories. Um, and Thank you, uh, 
thank you to Baker and Taylor. Thank you to Baker and Taylor for, for having us here and to Bobby for running this. So no um, problem. This is um I just had a, a a smile ear to ear the the entire time. Um thank you for bringing up uh, Chelsea Clinton, Kelly. Um, we actually had the opportunity of interviewing her last year and a couple other writers from the series when it first began. And, and that segment is also on our website. So I'll make sure everyone um, is redirected to where that lives along where this segment will live um, after the session here. But I also just wanna take the opportunity to once again, showcase each book. So we have um, The She Persisted Story of Maria Talchief by Christine Day. Thank you so much, Christine, for being here today. Um, such a pleasure. Um, and Renee Watson's um, she persisted on Oprah Winfrey. Again, another wonderful read. I, I really enjoyed. Um, I have a 16 month old little girl and I cannot wait to the day where she is able to read all these. Um, I'm gonna put them in her library though. They'll be there waiting for her. And um, we also have Kelly Starling Lyons um, store, uh, uh, title on Coretta Scott King. Um, of course, the awards were just a season just passed and um, what a pleasure to have that out right um and timing for that so all these titles i'm sure are already in your collections at the library but in case you need more or you miss them um they are available to order on title source 360 um and um you're also able to add the series she persisted to your standing order program through baker and taylor um I'd be remiss if I didn't end the session again by thanking you all, all four of you, all eloquent, all beautiful people, um, you know, all championing young minds and um, uh, all the, the embodiment of true intellect, um, passion and, um, and spirit. And I just want to say, as we celebrate uh, um, Women's History Month, it's obvious uh, you all um, not only champion um, women, but um, you champion each other. That was very obvious from, from the session, um, women um, holding up and um, rallying for other women. And I think I'll use a little bit more of that um, in, in the world. So thank you for, for that too. Um, I'm gonna get a little weepy. <laughs> so I'll just end it there. Um, and if anyone has any questions, you can reach us through our website, cats.baker-taylor-site.com. And um, I bid you all a really great day. And um, we're all fans here. So we're looking forward to your next, your next books outside the, the She Persisted uh, series. Thanks. Thank you. And Thank you're you. welcome to be an honorary member of the Persisterhood. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye now. Bye.